Terrifier 2. It's a slasher horror movie, a lot like the first one. And if you don't like gore in movies, I cannot stress how much you should not watch this film. I had mixed feelings after watching this one. I watched it right after Terrifier 1, that I enjoyed more than I thought I would, and 2 was rated higher than 1 on IMDb. And well, I don't think I liked this one as much as I did the first. The first one had a little magic that seems to be wholly missing in this one. I found the first one immersive. But it's nice to finally get some more British representation in Hollywood movies, and it's the hero of the film no less, by which I mean, of course, Art the Clown. He never talks, but well, look at the teeth. He may be from Norfolk, and if that's not British dentistry, I'll be surprised. There's also something about the hat that just screams both British and also a lover of musical theatre. And sorry to spoil the joke, but it kind of isn't true. The UK actually has some of the best oral hygiene in the world. According to this metric, we're allegedly tied for fourth best in the world with Sweden after Denmark, Germany and Finland. So sorry, America. In terms of statistics on dental health, you're supposedly lower than the UK and also Mexico. Anyway, Terrifier 2. I was once again shocked by what I found, because I liked how the first one broke away from a lot of the tropes of the horror slasher genre, and I was hoping for more of that from the second film. But what I got was the exact opposite of that. It instead ran headlong back towards tropes like The Last Girl and right back into cliché. It seemed desperately lacking in terms of original ideas. It borrowed so heavily from other films, mostly Nightmare on Elm Street a lot. It had dream sequences that bleed through into the real world, and this Sir. This just seems to be lifted straight from Stephen King's It. <laughs> Tell him! Tell him I'll see him tonight! And what it lacked in new ideas, it just tried to make up for with gore and violence. In the first film, I couldn't understand why, one, it's America and yet nobody is armed. Really. Nobody. In small town America, nobody. Okay, that's stretching believability for me. And also, two, why is everyone so relaxed around this murder clown? This movie is even worse than the first movie for this. It's now common knowledge in the film that there was a massacre carried out by a murder clown just one year ago. It was on the news and everything, his body then disappeared. And within just one year, people are now completely relaxed when the murder clown shows up again. He's in the exact same town. He looks exactly the same. And still, just a year after this massacre, by a clown monster still, Nobody is carrying anything. Nobody in the US. It's just untenable. The clown is seen as normal in the film because the film is set on Halloween and everyone just thinks it's a normal guy in costume. Annoyingly a plot point that the film seems to have lifted wholesale from the film series Halloween. This time the police don't even bother to come out even as bodies are dropping all over town. Now, the writer-director doesn't seem to really care about the story much, and instead seems to think the audience will prefer just more scenes of extreme violence. And from the IMDb ratings, he may very well be right. I went in hopeful to this movie, because this movie had a higher budget than the last one, but the story is more fragmented and makes even less sense than the first one. Granted, they got some better actors in. Lauren Levera, who plays the female lead, is not so bad at all, at least better than the actress from the first film, who kept on forgetting her leg was supposed to be injured. The outfit also does have a certain charm. I'm not sure I'd want a daughter of mine going out to a club like that. They also get to spend more money on effects and sets, and it also raises the bar on the violence. Quite a lot, really. I thought Terrifier 2 was being more lame and tame than the first one, until a scene where Art the Clown follows a young woman to her bedroom and then, dear God, Having a scene set in a bedroom is a horror classic because it's a place where people should feel safe and violating that will leave viewers lying awake at night thinking about murder clowns bursting into their bedroom. The young woman was not even safe in her own bed and by the same token, it could have been more effective to have people armed in the film if you make it completely useless to be so. If you have art, just shrug it off if you make it another way of removing people's feelings of safety. But seriously, even to me that scene felt a bit much. I repeat, 
If you don't like gore in movies, I cannot stress how much you should not watch Terrifier 2. I don't think I can show any of this scene, or should I say scenes on YouTube, because it goes on for multiple scenes. The clown first bursts into a room and slashes the young woman's face open with a scalpel, cutting one of her eyeballs open, and it really is quite realistic. He slowly scalps her with a pair of scissors, pins her to a bed and cuts her back open, breaks one of her arms, cuts the arm off at the break, rips her other arm in half lengthwise starting from the fingers. It just goes on and on for a frankly uncomfortable amount of time. And I can't see someone surviving the trauma she does for five minutes, never mind the prolonged time shown. She'd probably pass out from shock and blood loss within seconds, and I really don't like hearing people screaming in agony. There are many noises I like to hear women making, but that frankly is not one of them. By which I mean, of course, Hilary Hand playing the violin. Also the noise women make when you stroke. Never mind that right now. The levels of violence this film gets away with gave me pause, because in the UK, there were a thing called video nasties. In the early days of cassette tapes, the government banned certain films for violence and lewd conduct. And if you go back and watch them now, films like The Evil Dead or Zombie Flesh Eaters, the violent content is frankly nothing compared to this film. And people faced prison time for sale and distribution of that list of video nasty films. I still think that Spain maybe has it right. I'm not sure why censors are so soft on this sort of content, but come so hard, if you ignore the pun, for scenes of consensual romance, because heaven forbid the audience gets to see a couple making each other very happy, instead of a young woman screaming a lot as she's slowly dissected by a murder clown. And this led me to ask, does this film go too far? And what is too far? And I had to have a good think about it, because who's the arbiter going to be of that? Me? Shall we just censor things based on what I don't personally like? I don't think so. How about the UK government? This is the Prime Minister of the UK, by the way, talking about the Middle East. I call again for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. The return of the sausages. The hostages. And that was him calling for the release of the sausages. He meant hostages, he's just a bit of a burk. So do you trust that guy to be the arbiter of what people should be allowed to watch? Because I don't. So I asked myself, should nothing be censored? Because that would free up romance scenes with underage people as well. I concluded that censorship should maybe take a scientific approach. Does content like this make the audience more violent and disturbed? Less violent, or does it do nothing at all? Because if the answer is more violent, that would maybe make a case for censorship. Anything else and it wouldn't. And if movies like this make people less violent, well, then maybe people should be watching more of them. As for spoilers, the film opens up with Art the Clown coming back to life somehow after the first film. He's now missing an eye in the back of his head, but he does the coroner in, in particularly gruesome fashion, and then goes to a laundrette to launder his bloody clown costume. The clown costume continually bothers me because it's black and white and with the amount of blood this guy splashes around, there would be no white left on it at all, but there always is. A creepy young girl shows up that the film seems to imply some sort of demon, her and Art play patty cake, Art impales some guy through the head, and by the next time we see him, his eye and the back of his head have grown back off camera. Wait, what's going on? This film has many of the same problems as the first one in terms of having characters get butchered without ever really making them characters, and it makes it all a lot less impactful for me. The terrifying movies show a complete lack of patience. The first two both started with violence. It is attention grabbing, but it's hard to drag the movie back to a feeling of normality after you've done that. The story now also has a last girl in the form of Sienna, who lives with her mother who swears like a docker, and her brother who has a really weird neck. He may be the first human I've ever seen whose centre of mass appears to be his neck. Sienna is preparing for Halloween by making a racy Valkyrie costume based on some artwork done by her late father, who went crazy and told her that she has a destiny to defeat evil. 
Art the Clown then appears in one of Sienna's dreams, slaughters everyone until finally she produces a sword from a box of cereal. Art tries to set her on fire, she deflects the fire with the sword and then she wakes up back in her bedroom to see fire coming from the real life sword on her dresser and it sets the room on fire. What's going on? I mean, what's going on apart from what appears to be a homage to Nightmare on Elm Street? Dreams will not really play a part in the entire rest of the film. Sienna completes her outfit, goes to a Halloween party as Art goes around town butchering people with no subtlety whatsoever, somehow without anybody noticing. He does in all of Sienna's friends, including the really quite nasty bedroom scene of which I can show you nothing on YouTube, and then also does in her mother abducts the walking neck of a brother and uses him to lure Sienna to a long abandoned amusement park that for some reason still has all the lights on and electricity running. Sienna and her brother then take on Art. Sienna gets mortally wounded but just gets better somehow and just in time as Art has started to eat her brother. And how can there be any stakes if characters just keep on coming back to life? Sienna then lops Art's head off with a sword her father gave her, and I wouldn't stop at that. Not with how this guy just keeps on getting up from severe injuries. I wouldn't stop until Art the Clown was a thick paste covering the walls of the building, and then I'd burn the building down. The little demon girl then collects Art's severed head and takes it to the sanitarium, where the crazy woman who got her face eaten by Art the Clown in the first movie is being housed, and for some reason, the asylum is staffed by the actress Felicia Rose, who is in the horror series Sleepaway Camp, and the ex-wrestler Chris Jericho. What did I just watch? If you only knew the power of one, the power of two, oh. the power of many.